Good talk yesterday. Seriously? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's okay. Huh? Sorry? I haven't voted yet. I need to. I need to exercise my democratic right in the bright spots contest. Yeah. Vote early and often. In the bright spots contest, you, you can. I don't know if there's voter validation. Um, so let me. Hi, everybody. <laughs> There's a few seats, so uh, if you want to move up, feel free. I, I, it's nice to have the big room, but I was pretty sure we weren't going to get 300 people to come. Um, uh, my name is Nathaniel Heller. I'm from Global Integrity, which is an international NGO that works on issues of governance and transparency. And we've also done a lot of work to, over many years to uh, help get OGP off the ground. Uh, thanks very much for coming. Again, apologies for the cold, cavernous uh, room that we're in, which is funny because the, the structure of this this session and our hope and intent is to actually have a very informal but very robust uh, sort of debate and discussion. So the good news is you will not see stock presentations. There are no PowerPoint decks. Um, but we, we will be stuck behind the lecterns there, but it's going to be a real dialogue. And actually, we'll spend a lot of time opening it up for everybody else. There are a lot of friends and very smart observers and watchers of these issues already in the room. Um, and so you'll hear some great thoughts from, from the participants up here, but there's a lot of people here with some value to add. So we'll try and carve out a lot of time and not just at the end for actually uh, a real discussion. So the way we're going to run this, um, I'll do a couple quick uh, perfunctory introductions of everybody, um, sort of frame up what, what we're trying to get at with the uh, new frontiers, which I'll explain in a second. There'll be a really brief video that we produced that helps to set the stage further. Um, and then we'll have two parts of a sort of round robin discussion. The first is I'm going to be sort of pushing these really smart folks to try and make the case for why some of the issues that they work on, which range from money and politics to surveillance, privacy issues, civil liberties, should actually be part of the OGP dialogue and should show up in action plans moving forward. Uh, then we'll do a lot of discussion with the group here, and then from there segue into a second kind of round robin uh, where we're going to push them to give concrete recommendations. So if they were advising ministers or staff working on the next OGP plans in these countries and, and their civil society counterparts, what would they actually recommend to reflect some of the cases they've been making uh, in terms of commitments that might show up in action plans. So we called the, uh, the panel New Frontiers, which is... Uh, was not deliberately vague, but it certainly is a big fuzzy label. Um, really, this discussion is intended to give us a space here as a community attending the summit to talk about the edgy, hard, thorny, sticky, you can sort of fill in the blank with your adjective of choice, issues that actually are not really in the action plans, but we think should probably be there in the future. Uh, and I ticked off a number of them. These are um, 
not any less central or any less important, I think, for many of us when we talk about open governments, but if we look at the roughly 1,000 commitments, which is one of the statistics that's been floating around, um, you'll see everything we talk about today essentially doesn't show up anywhere um, in any action plan, whether in OECD countries, whether in the developing countries, this is just not part of the discussion. And so the whole intent, in a very simple sense of the next 90 minutes, is to make the case for these issues being part of the open government dialogue and the open government agenda. It's as simple as that, and as you'll hear, it's also as complex as that. Um, so let me um, now bungle a bunch of, of bios for four really incredible people that I'm completely delighted have, have uh, I've been able to sucker into this session. And for those that are less familiar, um, at the far end of the, the lectern there, Mort Halperin, He's had a long and storied career in the civil liberties space and the open society space. Uh, spent earlier part of his career at the Defense Department and the National Security Council in the United States during the Vietnam War. Spent many, many years doing incredible things at the ACLU in the US, the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, eventually ran the policy planning shop at the State Department, which is a very legendary position um, to really think about meta issues in US foreign policy. Um, and then helped to create uh, the Open Society Foundation's Washington office, which has been doing amazing work for many years. So Mort brings a, a really rich background and history to this. Um, moving down, German Brooks, uh, again, incredibly sort of storied uh, background, the former global cha chair of PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, German is now currently the chair of the Transparency International Business Advisory Board and is the former executive director and CFO of TI and has this incredible uh, sort of multi-stakeholder background, which uh, sort of is now his, one of his current jobs, chairing the Global Network Initiative, which is this first uh, really fascinating and complex multi-stakeholder uh, group that brings together internet and telecom companies with civil liberties groups uh, and others. So he'll get into what GNI does in a bit. Um, next down, Frank LaRue, who uh, currently serves, and I get this wrong every time, so I wrote it down, the, the f official title, the UN Spe Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of the Right to Freedom of Opinion and Expression. I don't know if that's on your business card. That's like, <laughs> I would run out of real estate on the card. Um, and, and Frank's a, a sort of incredibly brave and courageous human rights lawyer who um, fled Guatemala in 1981 after having worked to defend clergy and, and the unions there during the Civil War, um, has done a lot of work uh, in exile now, is, is sort of leading the charge on freedom of expression. And for those that watch this space, you'll know that Frank, in just the last few months, has started to bring the number of the issues we'll talk about today to the UN Human Rights Council, and has sort of elevated this debate in a way that's been really powerful. Uh, and last and certainly not least, Ellen Miller, uh, is a, just a true legend and sort of pioneering champion on money and politics and, and broader accountability issues both in the US and abroad. The founder of a number of famous groups including the Center for Responsive Politics which pioneered the use of data mining and data scraping around um, political contributions in the United States, uh, public campaign and also and certainly not least, Sunlight Foundation, which has become the tip of the spear in many ways for the global movements around open data and accountability and ways of leveraging technology um, around these issues. So I apologize, I'm sure I butchered all of the bios um, really badly. So why don't we roll the little video now and then we'll get into the, uh, uh, I'll have a couple quick remarks and then we'll get into the, the round robin.
So that's our video. Um, if, uh, by the way, if you're interested in the video, you can get it uh, at the Global Integrity website, which is new.globalintegrity.org, and you can share it. And it's downloadable. I think it's Creative Commons license, so you can butcher it as you please. Um, so this is a pretty simplistic presentation, but the, the basic idea there is, uh, in some ways, we've had steps forward and then we seem to have steps back. And the case we're trying to make today is that we need to broaden the horizon and bring in a lot of those red box issues, frankly, the sort of new frontiers issues, into the debate and into the dialogue. And I think we heard yesterday, or at least I picked up two things and I think others did as well, that actually were very timely examples of some of this tension that's been inherent in the movements over the past few years. So for those that were here, or for those that weren't here yesterday morning, there was a really wonderful speech um, given by the British Prime Minister to kick off the conference, David Cameron. And as part of that, there was the big announcement that the, the UK government would be making beneficial ownership information publicly available through public registries, which for those that watch that space has been a long sought uh, victory. And it's a huge, I think, example of leadership by the part of the UK government, which is terrific. Um, and, and that's you know, absolutely to, to be celebrated. And it comes on the heels, though, of you know, two days earlier, and here I'll just quote from Glenn Greenwald's uh, farewell column in The Guardian, I think it was yesterday. Um, so he says, British Prime Minister David Cameron, who again gave this speech yesterday here, said on Monday his government was likely to act to stop newspapers from publishing what he called damaging leaks from former US intelligence operative Edward Snowden unless they began to behave more responsibly. And then the quote from the Prime Minister was, if they, the newspapers, don't demonstrate some social responsibility, it will be very difficult for government to stand back and not to act. Uh, Cameron told Parliament, saying uh, Britain's Guardian newspaper had gone on to print damaging material after initially agreeing to destroy other sensitive data. And that's a, it is the quintessential tension here. Um, so on a Monday in Parliament, sort of a fairly naked threat to the press about reporting on certain issues that's, that's not good for government. And then on Wednesday, some incredible leadership in the same open government arena. So this, as Alex actually, Alex Howard, has described it, um, this cognitive dissonance almost um, in terms of open government is incredibly fascinating and also incredibly worrying. Um, and then I think even last night for those that were here in the, the closing plenary with Secretary Kerry when he made headlines by acknowledging that the U.S. government had gone, quote, too far in surveillance activities, um, again, highlights a lot of what we're trying to get at. So we want to broaden the horizon, sort of get into how do we get those red boxes as part of this discussion, and what would that look like then? In a way that's frankly politically realistic, so no one here is kidding ourselves that these are easy issues to tackle. These are really the hardest ones, the thorny issues. Um, so that's sort of the hope. So let me abandon the lectern, which is a good thing. Um, By the way, I did ask for soft seating, so they couldn't do that, so you have to suffer with the uh, slightly formalistic setup here. Um, so ideally, we'd be around couches and a coffee table. But Alan, do you want to kind of kick off and walk us through? I mean, you've, you've been doing this for so long and money and politics and sort of the corrosive effects of that money in the system, sort of why this sticks in your mind as something that needs to be more, you know, more and more part of the open government discussion? Um, absolutely, um, and uh, thank you for having me. And also, I want to compliment Global Integrity, Global Integrity on the terrific work that they have done over the years in the space of, you know, uh, political finance transparency. It's one of the few other uh, few organizations that that has really focused in this space. So, so my case um, is that issues that uh, pertain to free, open, democratic systems have to be core to any OGP plan. Uh, I want all of the data, and I want more modernized FOIA systems, uh, and I want commitments to um, IATI and, and many of the other multi-stakeholder initiatives. But if we do not have a focus on how our electoral systems operate and how they are financed, um, we really don't know whether we have democratic systems at all. Sort of simply put, without political finance transparency, there is little assurance of fairness in our elections or accountability for the candidates or elected officials. And that is true in the United States as it is true any place else in the world. And I would not say that the United States has the kind of political transparency, even given what we have, that assures us a complete, fair, and open system. So political finance transparency has been one of the weakest components of the country's anti-corruption framework since global integrity has done their work. Um, countries around the world continue to fail um, to both regulate and disclose their, uh, how, how their elections um, are actually financed. Uh, we looked uh, very quickly at the um, OGP commitments, and out of the 48 countries 
that have delivered commitments to the OGP, only six had a hint at regulating the flow of money in politics. Yet, I believe, and I, I hope you would agree with me, that this is a very basic, basic kind of concept. That obviously has to change, and that's, that's part of my argument. Um, according to the most recent IDEA database cataloging political finance laws, only 36 uh, countries ban political, uh, ban corporate donations. And though 143 countries require some kind of financial reporting, um, about 53% of those uh, have lots of loopholes in the law, and a lot of this is actually not reporting. Um, another piece of political finance transparency is accountability. In 40 countries uh, covered um, uh, that IDEA has reported on, no institution is given the formal role of examining the submitted financial reports or investigating potential violations of political finance regulations. And if we've learned anything in this space, if there's nobody looking over the shoulders of those who are supposed to report, then the likelihood of um, having full reports um, is uh, somewhere between slim and nil. Um, just in closing, um, I would want to say that, uh, that voters in our country um, need to know this information to prevent or curtail illegal fundraising, uh, to uncover the potential conflict of interest uh, involved in, um, in uh, political finance, to ensure that funds are being spent within the limits of the campaign finance laws and to determine whether and what fa uh, further changes need to be made. And we must have this in the OGP commitments. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Ellen. One quick question, then a, a quick follow-on thing, and then I'll, I'll turn to German. So what, how, how do you wrestle with the sort of free expression? Maybe, Frank, you can speak to this in a minute. But you know, the counter-argument in the US and now in some other countries has been that spending money on parties and candidates is a form of free expression, and I'm there supporting, you know, my guy and my gal, and that's, you know, so I have money, don't blame me. Um, you know, that's going to be tricky, I suspect, if this is, as we start to push this as a norm and as a priority in the open government movement, how do, you know, do you have thoughts? I don't, but <laughs> thoughts. how does one start to tackle that or reconcile with I'll that? I'll just that? try to be brief. I have lots of thoughts. Yeah. Um, the construct that, that uh, spending money equals free speech um, is something that the U.S. Supreme Court uh, pioneered um, in the 1970s, and even in that outrageous connection, I mean, what, what that means is if you have a lot of money, you have a lot more speech. And as we know in the U.S. that less than one-tenth of one percent provide the bulk of money for our political uh, elections, that means that one-tenth of one percent are determining who our candidates are and what they say. So even though the Supreme Court held that money is speech, they said disclosure of speech, transparency about money, and who's funding candidates uh, in the main um, is still something that uh, can prevent the appearance or the reality of corruption. So I think there's both a legal argument in the US um, and a practical argument to be made uh, around the world that disclosure, transparency, is very much in the public interest and can present, uh, prevent um, political corruption. Mm -hmm. One quick sidebar here. Um, a number of years ago, I was in Vanuatu, which is a sort of exotic island in the South Pacific. Um, we were doing some work, and uh, a problem there had been, and it continues to be, that um, traditional land that belongs to sort of uh, communities is being sold off to developers from Australia and New Zealand to build sort of resorts. And so it's sort of an interesting development question in a, for those here that focus on development issues. And ultimately, the explanation for a lot of why the government was making very poor decisions, which were not really in the best interest of the public was a political finance issue. Um, and it was often you know, about political contributions and donations. So I only raise that as a, a reminder for those that, that focus on the development space. Um, I think this is a very germane discussion as we look at transitional and emerging democracies and economies. Um, and the, the really frightening aspect is that for all the problems in many of the OECD countries in money and politics, it's, it is a basket case of an issue in the rest of the world. Um, so I think getting ahead of that curve is going to become really important. So end my editorial. Um, so pivoting uh, in a very sort of jerky way, um, Jeremy, do you want to sort of talk a bit about GNI and, and what it's doing? I mean, you're at the center of this maelstrom of a debate around surveillance and privacy, <laughs> and then sort of go into sort of how you all are seeing that and how the coalition sees it as part of the, the OGP and the open government dialogue. Right. Well, thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. Um, perhaps I ought to apologize, first of all, why are we talking about um, even the internet and standards on the internet? If we think what the OGP is calling for. It's calling for more and more information being available 
to citizens, citizens being able to participate mainly electronically back to government. And so the standards around communications, uh, mainly based these days on the internet, are very, very important. And that's why I would support uh, Nathaniel's early comments about uh, this being a gap uh, in the uh, present OGP um, system of issues that, that need to be looked at and need to be watched very carefully uh, from uh, those states that are participating. So wh why am I talking then uh, about a multi-stakeholder initiative, which is a multi-stakeholder initiative between uh, companies, so the major ISPs, uh, the Microsoft, Googles, Yahoo, Facebook, and so, and so on, uh, the major uh, human rights NGOs and some uh, brilliant technical NGOs like uh, CDT, the Center for Democracy and Technology, um, investors, and also academics who have given a lot of thought uh, to uh, the impact of uh, the internet on society and very specifically, which is the concern of GNI, uh, the impact of the internet on human rights, namely freedom of expression, and user privacy uh, in relation to governments. In other words, uh, what should be the reaction of companies uh, supported by these other stakeholders to requests for information from uh, governments? So that's why we're in the middle of the present surveillance uh, discussions or crisis, if you want to call it that. Um, but also uh, the uh, censorship uh, activities of governments. So censorship and surveillance uh, when uh, in narrowly defined cases are justified, um, otherwise, uh, according to human rights standards, they should be resisted. And so that was really the, the starting point uh, for GNI. Um, and uh, I think two aspects uh, make it unusual. First of all, it's, it, it is fairly unique in this space uh, as a multi-stakeholder initiative. Um, but it's also unusual in the form of multi-stakeholder initiatives because it's not um, a, a sort of debate where the different constituencies occasionally come together, perhaps once or twice a year. They sit permanently together, uh, and a dialogue takes place permanently between the members. So if a particular human rights NGO uh, is surprised by something that Microsoft is doing in country X, uh, then it doesn't wait uh, for the next meeting where we're sitting together, but they go directly to Microsoft, uh, challenge them, uh, get answers, and then if it's a, a more principled issue, then it will be given a much wider circulation within uh, the membership of GNI. Uh, and if necessary, then we come to a resolution or we make then a public statement as GNI about it. So uh, that's the first thing. The second is, and I was very interested in the discussions which took place in the plenary this morning, uh, on the IRM, um, horrible acronyms everywhere, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, people don't believe what you're doing unless there's a degree of independent review uh, by credible third parties. And that is what um, GNI agreed to right at the beginning, that the companies who are committing to upholding uh, the principles of freedom of expression and user privacy, that they will... Um, be called to account through an independent assessment process. Uh, we're just completing the second round of that now, uh, and later on in November at our board meeting, uh, we will be receiving those reports, and we'll be formally uh, forming a view on whether the founding companies, which are Microsoft, Google, and Yahoo, whether they are compliant with our principles. So it's, it's a pretty tough process, uh, and I think the, the companies are brave, but I think what we're now learning is that um, the world since the beginning of June has changed. Uh, and so is GNI um, still credible? Um, can companies make the claim that they are supporting human rights, particularly the human rights of freedom of expression and above all user privacy uh, in the face of mass surveillance? Uh, what has their role been in accepting uh, some of these uh, government rules, not just in the US, although that's given, of course, the greater prominence, uh, but in many European countries and other countries around the world. Uh, the mass surveillance is, uh, we now discover, almost the norm. So where are companies standing in, in this situation, and what collectively, as a multi-stakeholder organization, can we 
what should our response be? Well, our initial responses have been uh, in the form of ad advocacy to call for greater government transparency. So government should say uh, what they're doing in this area. And if they are calling for interception of customer data, then uh, by the kinds of categories that they're calling for this data, th there should at least be some overall transparency of uh, this activity. So if they're calling for it for uh, terrorist um, um, identification, if they're calling for it for other uh, types of law enforcement, uh, more general perhaps security issues, uh, we'd like to know that and we'd like to know the numbers uh, of uh, intercep interception requests. Because on the other hand, what then the companies need to do, and of course the unique situation <coughs> Uh, of uh, the major ISPs, the, the internet platforms, is that rather unlike in many other industries where uh, the, there was, they, they almost began with state uh, centralized regulation, this is very much a private sector um, uh, created industry. Uh, and therefore, they have, by their, their very mentality, been much more used uh, to challenging government, to, to standing outside government, and there are contrasts there with the telecoms industry, which we can talk about mm -hmm. uh, perhaps a little yeah. bit later. Uh, but So they are used to challenging, and some of them, as you may know, have begun to produce transparency reports. So they're reporting on a country-by-country -country basis how many interception requests have they had, how many censorship requests have they had, and so on. Uh, and what they're now uh, asking, and GNI's position is, that we're asking governments to remove the gagging orders from these companies because they're not allowed to report uh, in many cases, uh, particularly where it's um, for security purposes. So we're asking um, specifically uh, in the United States for the gagging orders of uh, FISA and FIST to be removed or to be, to be lessened, and there is a sign uh, that there is movement in this direction. And of course, as you may know, there are um, draft um, laws uh, which are tabled um, in, in Congress and will be very interesting to see how that moves. Uh, there are a lot of activities through civil society. Um, the companies themselves yesterday have just written to Congress, um, uh, so the, f the four members of um, GNI uh, plus AOL and Apple, uh, calling for reform in this area. Um, and um, GNI has also written to all of the 14 states, I think all of which are OGP members, uh, which are members of the uh, Freedom Online Coalition, uh, reminding them uh, that they have obligations which they've committed to uh, in terms of freedom of expression and, and privacy. So um, the, the, there is um, a huge amount of work to be done here. Uh, and interestingly, there's a strong alignment between the company's position and the very strong position of our uh, particularly human rights NGOs uh, calling for uh, more control of government so that there is ultimately greater credibility uh, in the data uh, which we'll all be looking at. And unless we achieve that, uh, I would, uh, coming back to my opening point, uh, say that uh, you know, the call for a greater transparency and greater flow of information in OGP is uh, faulted unless we include this element. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks, Jeremy. And it, is it, so is it correct to sort of in some ways sum that up, that the, what you're hearing and watching and seeing from both industry and also the others in the multi-stakeholder initiative is that is a, this is ultimately an expression and a sort of uh, a rights issue that then brings it into the open government space. I mean, that's sort of what I hear, I don't, but I don't want to mischaracterize it. That's inc incorrect. Y yes. Um, I mean, I, I think our old image was, we, so we looked at the non-democratic countries and, mm -hmm. and you sort of saw uh, not open government, but transparent customer, transparent users. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, everything that they did was uh, accessible by the state and, and was very often accessed. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas we saw ourselves the other way around as at least uh, reaching certain elements of open government, uh, but uh, we were you know, uh, protecting uh, the, the privacy levels of our users. And I think what we've, what we've now learned is that uh, the, the human rights of the consumer to retain information uh, which they don't want to put in the public space mm -hmm. uh, is, is being, um, uh, on, on a mass scale, uh, ignored by many, many Western governments. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it becomes so important in the OGP context. Yeah. No, thanks. 
Um, so more, you've worked on a lot of this for a long time. I mean, I mean, I'll just sort of let you sort of riff on what you've just heard, but I mean, a lot of this cuts close to the bone, I suspect. Right. I mean, let, me, let me start with a slightly different perspective that comes to the same conclusion, and that is uh, uh, national security is often said by governments to be outside the scope of a discussion of, of openness uh, and, and even normals of democratic society. And I think OGP reflects that. Uh, while some of the work plans that have been put up by civil society have covered uh, national security issues, governments by and large have taken the traditional view uh, that national security is an exception to everything, including a commitment uh, to open government. And I think the events of the last few months now uh, demonstrates how unacceptable that is. Uh, a commitment to openness must include a commitment to reasonable principles of what openness uh, means and stands for uh, in the area of national security, including surveillance, as it does in every other area. And I think uh, we need to now start demanding uh, that governments include uh, commitments in this area uh, as part of their commitment uh, to open government. Uh, on the secrecy side, I want to call your attention to the Chuan principles, which were developed by the Open Society Justice Initiative and endorsed uh, and worked on with them by a number of other groups, which lay out principles of secrecy as it relates to national security and suggest limits on what can be classified and withheld, but also suggests affirmative obligations of government, even in the area of national security, to release certain kinds of information uh, about what they are doing uh, in the world so that citizens of democratic countries can uh, affect policies, can judge their leaders knowing uh, what they are doing. It is simply unacceptable for a government to go to war uh, or to spy on everybody in its society and to spy on people throughout the world without people being able to decide whether they want that and whether they want to reelect the government uh, that is doing that. Um, one area, in addition to the surveillance, which I think has come into public view lately and which needs to be addressed, is the issue of drones. Uh, because here again, we have democratic governments, including especially the American government, claiming the right to kill people all over the world uh, based on principles which they have not explained. They have not explained how this relates to international legal obligations, except to assure us, so that we don't need to be bothered about it, uh, that in fact this is fully consistent with international law. And 30 years from now, when we read the secret legal memos from the U.S. government, we will understand why this was fully acceptable under international law. I think that is unacceptable in a democratic society if a state claims the right to use military force uh, to engage in what appears to be uh, uh, unlawful disappearances, uh, it has an obligation to explain the legal principles, to explain how they apply to the situation. And the same is true has already been suggested in the area of surveillance. There has been in the last few days a statement by a group of American NGOs calling upon the United States to take the lead um, in the open government partnership to discuss this issue, and Secretary Kerry may have inadvertently responded positively uh, to that request. There is also now an effort uh, by international NGOs to echo this and to support it, um, and again, to call on OGP to cooperate. There is discussions that many of you are aware of, of creating at least a civil society working group uh, on this issue if the governments are not yet uh, ready uh, to be drawn in. Uh, and we'll come later, I think, to what, what the principles should be, but I think the basic point is that uh, when, a, when a democratic government is spying not only on its own citizens, but citizens of democratic countries around the world, I think it has an obligation, first of all, to be public about what it claims the right to do, and then I think to accept limits on what it actually can do uh, 
that respects the privacy not only of its own citizens, but of other people around the world. Thank you. That's great. More, thank you. A, a quick thought <clears throat> that links to a number of other discussions here at the summit already. For those that work on budget and fiscal transparency, I mean, this is well-tread territory, but the issue of national security budgets, uh, I think, is a really fascinating touch point to explore further as a, a slightly potentially safer area that's, you know, we, we've made a lot of progress as a community in the past decade on budget transparency and fiscal transparency, but national security budgets often remain a black box, and that is an interesting entry point for potentially getting into some of the really tough issues that more raised. Um, you should note that one mm -hmm. of the Snowden documents <clears throat> is, in fact, the yes, intelligence budget. agency yeah. budget, uh, which the intelligence community has been telling us for years <clears throat> that if it's ever made public, Western civilization as we know it will come to an end. Um, it turned out that does not seem to have happened. And in fact, one of the intelligence officials was asked by a member of Congress to explain what the harm was now that we see what the document is. Uh, and he gave the usual line, it will help our adversaries understand what we do, and therefore <laughs> terrible things will happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that is it. And that was after, it was heavily redacted as well by the journalists. I mean, it was not even the full details. But anyway, um, last and certainly not least, Frank, I mean, you've been sort of wrestling with many of these issues at the, the truly global level within the UN system and, and, and really pushing the Human Rights Council. What's the state of play there? How do, I mean, you've been trying to link up, I think, a number of, of the issues that, that everyone else has raised. How, what is the state of play? How do you see the, the UN and others sort of gravitating or not towards this agenda within the open government space? Let me, thanks, Nathaniel. Let me mention three issues that are related to freedom of expression that I, I also would like to launch yeah, as, a, sure. as a proposal here, since you were asking for a specific proposals. But let me begin by the first one, which was in, in regards to my last report to the Human Rights Council, which, by the way, was a few days before the Snowden scandal, which made it more credible because I was not reacting to the scandal, but it was prior. Uh, which was on state surveillance and privacy. And this is a report that I must say we drafted with the support of civil society, especially of uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation and Privacy International and other NGOs that say, helped a lot in regional consultations. And the, the bottom line, what I say in the report is that national security is a legitimate activity of any state. And it's a matter of fact, it's an obligation of the state to guarantee security to its citizens. But how do we understand national security? How do we understand threats? I say in the report that national security is not only to defend individuals from harm, it is also important to defend democratic institutions. And it's also very important to defend democracy as our system. So democratic societies believe in national security because they'll protect individuals, but their own form of government and political system. If you miss on one of those elements, you're really then not protecting your people because a dictator can also give individual protection to his citizens, an authoritarian regime, but be undemocratic. And this is exactly the problem with civil liberties. If in the name of security we're willing to sacrifice civil liberties, then what we are building is an authoritarian regime. We're losing our democratic nature. And this is what many countries don't want to understand. And I think some of them have admitted more th than others in, in this matter. And more importantly, some issues should be, be, remain secret, I understand, because they would be a concern. And, and, and Mort has already mentioned the Schweiner principles, which I worked, uh, had the privilege of working with, uh, with, with the Justice Initiative of, of, of Open uh, Society. And I believe that that was an important effort to qualify the exceptional cases in which the information should not be released, but those should be seen as an exception, not as the rule. The rule should be the openness. And I think what the scandal brought, the recent scandals, was beyond the fact that this was happening regularly with very little surveillance, is the massiveness in which it happened. No one, because everyone thinks in terms of intelligence uh, and uh, activities and monitoring activities of targeted individuals, someone who is seen to be a danger linked to organized crime or underground terrorist groups. But if all of a sudden what you see is a blanket surveillance of everyone in the country, then the conditions of this decision is, are not very clear. So what I say in my report is, yes, you can have surveillance, but in a democratic society, you must do that within a democratic rule of law. You need legislation that supports that. You need a judiciary oversight and you need a parliamentary oversight. And it cannot be a judicial oversight in a blanket way. Even the FISA court has recently said that they had 
they didn't have the elements to follow through in the recommendations and to see if effectively they were being verified. So, because some of these issues of, of judiciary oversight or parliamentary oversight can just be symbolic, that's not enough. The really, democracy is about checks and balances, and therefore there has to be checks and balances. What I find unacceptable, and I know that this offends many people, is that those that hold political power, meaning the governments, those that are in security agencies, whether the police or the military, or those that are intelligent agencies, cannot make the decision by themselves. Why? It's not that they will make a bad decision the first time. It is that inevitably, if they have the full power to make these decisions, it will always end in the form of abuse. Sooner or later, it will, if, you, if the system begins to break down, which is, I think, what we, we were seeing in this sort of, sort of massive scandal, is that the checks and balances and the judiciary oversight was breaking down, sooner or later they will lead to abuse of internal elements of the country, of the benefit of political parties or political interests. I mean, people forget that that's what Watergate was about. It was one president and a political party monitoring the communications or the conversations of another. I mean, these are the issues we cannot allow because then we lose the democratic element that makes this so important. This, by the way, is the relationship with the, with the funding of, of, of elections and campaigns that you had been asked before, is that democracy is based on the fact that everyone has equal opportunity. So equal opportunity cannot be based on, on the money, as you were saying, not he who has more money can pay more, more publicity and therefore get more votes. Well, that would be undemocratic, would challenge our own principles of democracy, the idea uh, my next report, by the way, to the council is going to be on freedom of expression and political communication. We'll see how it goes. But, but uh, the idea is precisely to look at democracy from the perspective of freedom of expression, where the decisive factor is the equality in the exercise of freedom of expression or of political participation, and not the use of money or resources. I can give you examples from Latin America coming from Guatemala. The real challenge now is not even who has the money or big corporations. The real challenge is who has the biggest amount of money is organized crime, the drug lords. And they have candidates. They're actually funding. There's many mayors that are funded. So if we actually allow this to happen and to go unchecked, there's one candidate for president. So the next president of Guatemala may end up being a guy funded by the drug lord. So I think it's very important to prevent this by creating the transparency. This is one of the challenges mm -hmm of, of the, 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 the open government uh, partnership. Um, finally, I would say that the, the last thing is on my last report to the General Assembly, which was last week, <laughs> on Friday the 25th, was on the right to truth. And obviously, as a human rights advocate, I give great importance to issues related to human rights. The biggest obligation of any state is to guarantee the enjoyment of all people, not only its citizens, but all people under its jurisdiction. Why? Because all rights are universal. All rights should be enjoyed by every single person without a difference of race, color, nationality, uh, language, religion, or any other form of socioeconomic origin. We all have, human rights are not the maximum level or a minimum standard that should be guaranteed by every single state around the world. So if this is the case, it's one of the biggest obligations of the state is to guarantee the exercise of fundamental freedoms and human rights in general then there is very little reason to maintain the secrecy of why those human rights are being violated. Mm -hmm. The information related to human rights violations, which is normally known as the right to truth, it's the right to know the truth of human rights violations, should not be kept secret. So that should be also a privileged information. And I, what I did in my report to, to close what had been worked on in, in, in the UN and following the principles on impunity that Diane Orlinker updated, is that the truth is the first step to eradicate impunity, even if there are no legal procedures. So it, it is linked to the right to justice, but even if there is no justice, mm -hmm. truth in itself is very powerful. So the idea is that this should be a right not only of victims and the relatives, it should be a right not only in societies in transitional, transitional justice, should be a right of every single person in a country to know why human rights occurred, whether they are violations of the past or violations of the present. Mm -hmm. The people of a nation have a right to reconstruct their history, and only the peoples of a nation that have the right to fully acknowledge their history, even with the tragic moments of that history, and memorialize that part of history, will be free, truly free, to design their, their future. Yeah. 
Thanks so much. Um, more, you had a quick yeah. thought you wanted to jump in with. Frank just said something nice about my wife, so I'm hesitant to attack him. But <laughs> <laughs> nevertheless, yeah, uh, I want to challenge the notion <clears throat> that the surveillance that we now hear about fits within the covenant because it's under the jurisdiction. Uh, I mean, assume for the moment that the prototype of this is that the British government intercepts American emails from the United States to France when they pass through the UK. Can you really argue that the person who sent that email or even the email is, quote, under the jurisdiction of the British government and therefore covered by the covenant? I was relating it to the right to truth, to the information on human rights violations. But it is true, going back to the communication, which is your question, it is true that the right to privacy is, for me, a universal right. And therefore, we should all try to respect the universality of all human rights. Um, privacy should be no different within the US jurisdiction than it should be under any other jurisdiction. Um, one of the arguments I heard here in Britain is that in a debate I had in the BBC with, with government officials is there has to be a good faith attitude and respect the policy decisions of the government because they're always well intended and this is a democratic nation. I said that doesn't necessarily always work. I mean you can, in democratic nations, you can end up having a misuse of information and end up having an authoritarian regime. The, the final control of democracy is the checks and balances you create. And that, for me, has to apply a principle of universality of all rights. And yeah. This, I know, is questionable in the US because of the, the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment. But for me, as a UN rapporteur, it's important to uphold the same rights for all people in all parts of the world, in all nations. So could I have one? Yeah, sure. uh, I, I agree with you as a matter of principle and a matter of what is right. What, what I was asking is, can we really argue that this is an obligation under the covenant on civil and political rights. And that's what I don't think is persuasive. Others may have thoughts. We'll turn, uh, we're gonna take a quick break, I mean, for, for Q&A, but um, yeah, German had a, one or two thoughts, I yeah. Maybe Ellen, and then we'll open it up. I, I just wanted to follow up yeah. on, on universality, because <coughs> the, the good news is, uh, it's not often the case, but this time we have uh, big business on the side of universality. If you think of the Googles and Facebooks of this world, they have far more customers uh, using their services outside the US than inside. So that's put a huge amount of pressure on them, and there are both opportunities for reform, for improvement uh, of the legal structures, certainly uh, primarily in the US where uh, these companies have their, their head offices, but also in, in other countries as well as we realize the dimensions of this problem. So um, th that's the good side. I think the worrying aspects are that uh, certainly in Europe, uh, we're beginning to talk about um, uh, not actually putting up fences, but making sure that all European data uh, runs through European-based servers so that it's no longer accessible. So I think, we and uh, all of us have been uh, aware of the discussions about uh, concerns uh, about the, uh, the cloud, and now we're hearing about interception uh, of um, uh, transfers of data between uh, huge data centers. So I think what, what, we're, uh, what we could have as a reaction would be going in the wrong direction. We'd be moving uh, the internet into a nationally based or perhaps regionally based uh, set of structures, which of course is exactly what uh, the Chinese, uh, the Iranians, just to give two examples, have been working for. And, and so th th this is really in the center of what uh, you know I've perceived coming into the uh, the, the internet world uh, relatively late in my life um, as a little bit uh, the Cold War that uh, we've got to be very careful doesn't move in the wrong way between those who want a closed and controlled internet and those who are still uh, very supportive of, of the open, uh, bottom-up, creative um, structure of the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we'll quick, maybe quick shot for Ellen. I mean, the, so a potential sort of uh, drug baron sponsored candidate becoming president because of the money. I mean, this is, a, I flag this generally as this is a really huge issue for emerging democracies, but I mean, do you see similar examples or sort of worries, um, potentially not as stark, but 
I mean, this is, hey, this that's, is a, where that's a pretty stark example, yeah. and I'm now more <clears throat> frightened than I've ever been, and I've been plenty frightened along the way. Um, I mean, it, while they may not be drug lords uh, becoming uh, president of the United States, um, to have Wall Street become the president of the United States is a reality. Um, so, so I think the concern, you know, is very, very real. What, what I was thinking um, in the context of this of the conversation we're having this morning is let's draw it back a little bit and sort of recognize that OGP has failed to deliver uh, commitments on these extremely fundamental questions. It's any of these that we have, um, have discussed. Um, and in a way, I mean, if you look at what the OGP commitments have been in bulk, it's the easy stuff. Now, I, I know this is not easy for governments to make these commitments. Um, but in fact, it is the easy stuff, or it should be the easy stuff. And then these more difficult questions are things that we have to, to, uh, to work on uh, with all of our you know, individual governments. Um, and we have to begin to, to see whether this institution, the OGP, is real and whether it is real will be judged by how well they take on these issues. There was an email flurry 10 days or so ago, and Nathaniel and I were on part of it, and I sent a note and I said, can somebody give me some really concrete examples of impact from OGP commitments that have been melt, uh, met? And I sent an email to one person and they said, oh my gosh, I just got the same question from somebody else. Um, and we all came up with the same two examples. That is not good, even on the easy stuff. So I'm not sure where this takes us strategically in terms of OGP, but it's just, it's a point that is very sobering in terms of what can we hope to accomplish through this institution and therefore, um, you know, where do we push our governments to, how do we push our governments into these new frontiers? So why don't we open it up a little bit for a discussion, I'm sorry, uh, Frank, for 30 seconds and then we'll try and do a 10 minutes of that and then come back for some kind of concrete recommendations and see if we can do some more. But yeah, really. really yeah. <laughs> Oh, I can wait for the country. Sure. Okay, so why don't we, yeah, no, not, I'm sorry to abuse you. Right. Your, uh, abuse you. Uh, yeah, so why don't we just, um, whether folks have reflections on what's been said, other issue areas that actually should be part of this new frontiers, um, dialogue, and, you know, let's just kind of get into a debate and see where we go. Hi, um, my name's Abby Paulson. I'm with OpenTheGovernment.org. And going off what Ellen was just discussing and the reluctance <clears throat> of OGP countries to address the tough issues, um, we were involved in pulling together the letter that Mort was talking about. Um, the CSO is calling for the US to address surveillance and secret law and drones um, at the OGP. But I was just wondering if you guys as observers of the OGP think that the mechanism has to change in order to make the OGP that hammer or that leverage to force countries to make the tough commitments. Um, I mean, just really briefly, my own view. I, no, I, th I mean, the bottom line is, if these if these sorts of issues are not embraced organically at the at the domestic level, then I I, I would shy away from a top down approach. I mean, I think there's a need to make the case and sort of beat the drum and provide some real examples and some inspiration and leadership. But uh, just personally speaking, I don't think we'll achieve a, a lot if we gravitate towards a bunch of mechanisms and penalties or, or even carrots that sort of somewhat artificially encourages to happen. I think it's going to happen and happen in a legitimate way when it's bottom up to abuse the cliche. Um, so I think there's a role for OGP to help broadcast and trumpet and amplify some messaging around this and to provide some real inspiration examples. But I think it will also look really different in, in different countries. So there's clearly a set of kind of emerging scandal and controversy in the United States, but there, it's out there in other places, but it's a very different version of it. And I think then the responses and the reforms will be pretty different. So my own quick answer is I'd like to see it largely driven bottom up, which does put some onus on civil society, but I think there is then a role for political top cover from OGP to say, look, this is, this is part of the space. You know, you can't not talk about it. What the solution is, is up to you all. Yeah, Alex. Here's your mic. Sorry. So, uh, you know, you've now brought up money in politics, mass surveillance, drones, freedom of expression, human rights, civil liberties. If you read the U.S. National Action Plan and the Iron Report on that action plan, these things aren't in it. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this is something that's been a consistent criticism across countries as well. So, to what extent um, can OGP and people participate in a, a really 
work to get these fundamental issues, which, you know, frankly, I think kind of beggar some of the more uh, uh, banal ones that sometimes dominate the conversations because mm -hmm. they're uncomfortable to get into this, to put those onto the agenda so that countries are actually being measured on fundamental open mm -hmm. government reforms. Now, this is not to say that um, every country or every plan is guilty of this. For instance, I think freedom of information laws are, are a fundamental open government reform and that being graded upon the quality and movement towards them is a very important thing. Uh, but for instance, the use of drones or secrecy around them is something a lot of people in the U.S. would love to have seen that on that report. How does that get onto the agenda? Um, and does mm -hmm. it have to be forced by someone from civil society saying, hold on, let's have one more question on the panel? Yeah, it's, I'll let others, but super quick on that. I mean, I think, um, yes, it will probably need to come first from, you know, non-governmental stakeholders, whether it's the business community or whether it's civil society saying, look, this has to be part of the discussion. I think the challenge for governments, though, is equally to broaden the group that is at the table from the government side. And so I know in the American context, you know, specifically, uh, nobody from NSA is in the OGP consultations, right? Um, Nobody. <laughs> that's a fair point. <laughs> um, uh, and so that that is tricky. But I think that is actually there's some creative creativity that can be embraced by government for broadening the circle. So it's not just the Open Data Office. It's not just the Office of Innovation. It's not just even the Prime Minister's office. Um, but it really has to include some other stakeholders from other parts of government, and that requires some real internal leadership and probably some budding of heads. Um, but I think it, you know, so maybe there's an impetus first on the part of non-governmental stakeholders to say this has to be part of the dialogue. But then when it's time to sit down. There needs to be folks at the table who have their hands on the levers, and I think that's really what we're lacking in a number of countries. There's just, there's no, you know, this is a real issue of power um, in many or most or all governments, and unless you have folks that control some of these programs and have access to the, you know, to both budgets and to authority around them, hard to get, you know, some, you know, wonderful, you know, FOIA advocate in the wherever Department of Justice to go and beat up on the CIA. I mean, that just doesn't happen, and I think that's why the circle has to be broadened. And I'm using the American example, but it works in many or, or most other countries. Yeah. Sorry. I would I would also add that um, that the whole process of consultation has to be changed so that it is not only has broader actors in it, but it's not just a consulting with the NGO sector, which is basically in the U.S. being told what they're going to do. Yes, they'll take our papers and they'll read them, but being told what to do, as opposed to, I think, what was originally envisioned as a collaborative process. Let's talk about what these priorities should be. Um, but other than, I think at this point, speaking loudly and speaking clearly about what we see as the inadequacies of the country's plans and or the implementation of them, um, that's, that's a first step, and that hasn't really been done very much. Others have quick thoughts on that? Yeah, more. Okay. Or Jeremy. After you. Okay. Well, uh, ju just two comments, and I think those of us who uh, participated in the plenary this morning and listened to the IRM debate will understand <coughs> some of the problems that uh, OGP is coping with. Um, all of the companies are at slightly different stages. Um, they're going to be, um, as it was then explained, uh, on a journey. The trouble is that those journeys will not be parallel at all. They'll be, they'll be very different. So comparability is a big problem. Uh, but I think much greater effort is going to have to be placed on the um, assessment process, so this IRM mechanism. Uh, I mean, even the person who was responsible for it was trying to be polite and said, well, um, you know, perhaps uh, two, two points uh, out of three or two and a half, I think then she added. Um, frankly, um, unless that assessment process uh, has uh, more guts to it, um, is given wide distribution, and then governments are held accountable for what they're doing with it, then I, I think it will go the way of many other uh, very, very good um, uh, principles, sets of principles, which, um, you know, and many of us know several of them, uh, which then die because uh, there's no real credibility in, in the public domain. So I think that is a very important element that needs to be given continued uh, emphasis, but it's very difficult because all countries will be reviewed from their base rather than from a common base, although the, obviously the, objection, the objective is uh, to move to a common base where we have um, certain key standards that are being checked everywhere. And I think, you know, I would uh, support very much what Ellen said, that uh, there are 
some key issues, which are difficult ones, which are perhaps not there and should be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mark, so I think any organization that leads to an occasion in which the American Secretary of State says the United States has gone too far in its surveillance can't be all bad, and we need to keep that in mind. There also have been a number, I think it's important for us to say, on the one hand, that you must deal with national security issues and surveillance issues, but not to say it in a way that suggests everything that's happened so far is trivial, because mm -hmm. I think it clearly is not. Freedom of Information Act, U.S. and, and U.K. joining EITI, uh, many countries adopting new Freedom of Information Acts, uh, the British government announcing its, uh, the fact that the, the index is going to do an index in beneficial ownership and it's going to be made public. All of those are things that probably would not have happened but for the pressure of o OGP deadline. So I think we need to balance those two things and make not get into a position where we say this ends next year unless uh, you describe publicly what your surveillance uh, policies are. But while I think we need to keep pushing, and I think it has to come nationally, I agree, we're not going to, OGP is not going to have a rule that you have to state your surveillance positions. I think we have to take this on uh, country by country and starting with the countries that conduct the major surveillance activities, and I think uh, it's not a secret who those countries are. Yeah. Um, so I've done really badly keeping us on time. We're, we're yeah. bleeding into the, towards the end. So why don't we take two really quick ones, super quick, uh, if you can, and then let me pivot to the four up here for really brief versions of their granular recommendations, and then uh, we'll see, you know, if those who want to stick around, we can, we can run long. Anthony, what's on your mind? Thanks. Just a very brief uh, thanks to the panel, and maybe a specific recommendation that emerged in a previous uh, panel that was uh, on police reform, that we, <coughs> under the OGP, create a working group to um, bind together those interested in working on the grand challenge uh, for creating, creating safer communities mm -hmm. that deals with uh, the public safety, security sector, disaster crisis response, and environmental threats. But I think that uh, there was good energy coming out of that from uh, the uh, UK uh, police uh, representative uh, on policing. And I think that if we bind this together into a, an active working group, it could focus a lot of disparate conversations. I think it's worth pointing out that this Creating Safer Communities Grand Challenge, I don't have this statistics probably, Nathan, you have that at your finger fingertips, is probably the least populated of all grand challenges in the whole OGP, mm -hmm. and we ought to make the next two years under Indonesia's leadership uh, a change in that. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I think you're probably right, yeah. Uh, another real quick one, if anybody's got it. Uh, Anne, since you're near the mic, feel free. Thanks. Um, Anne Jalama from the Web Foundation. I agree with Alex's um, comment that we need to have OGP action plans include commitments around that. I think it's a good way to make the most of what the OGP can offer as a lever. It's one lever among many others that will be needed to get change here. I think another thing that is absolutely crucial right now is for the open government transparency accountability community, especially the CSOs, to make the links with the organizations that work on privacy, that work on digital rights, that work on surveillance. I was just at the Internet Governance Forum in Bali, community of very, very passionate CSOs that have worked on digital rights and human rights issues for years, agonizing about how to get more voices. And because the public response has been very, very muted yeah. in most countries outside the U.S. And even in the U.S., it's not big enough, it's not broad enough. Um, and people shouldn't fool themselves that this is only a U.S. issue or a U.K. issue. As Frank's report made clear, governments around the world are rapidly expanding their surveillance powers. Um, it's very hard to find a single Western European government that is, can be cleared of mm -hmm. complicity in, in all of this. India is doing it. South Africa is trying to do it. I mean, it's governments that don't have the capacity are moving very quickly to acquire the capacity, and those that do have the capacity are use it. So we, we all have to work together to, as Ellen was saying, just making more noise and raising our voices. And the, the transparency community needs to link with others to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Martin, I know you've thought about this for a while. Really. Yeah. Th thanks. <laughs> I just wanted to reinforce um, and very much agree with Anne's point. I think 
One of the reasons why it's important to build those bridges between groups working on human rights, surveillance, privacy, and open government, amongst others, is that the open government and open data movement will be undermined severely by this issue, privacy, personal data, and surveillance. And one of the things that we can do very concretely to try and avoid that is to move forward and engage very directly in the debate. And my sense is, I never quite got the point that Hillary Clinton made, or quite agreed with the point made in Brasilia, the last summit, that open versus closed was between countries that were open and countries that were closed. My sense is open versus closed is within countries as well. And what we need to be engaging in is looking at the totality of government, of information. What is the piece that's open and what is the piece that is legitimately retained by government and that's closed? And that includes personal data, it includes business information, it includes national security, which is what the Chuani principles do. And what we need to get really engaged in between the communities is what is that delineation? What's open and what's closed and that's okay. And we need to be mm -hmm. very upfront about that. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so in the spirit of trying to keep us semi on track, why don't we just go from Ellen down, sort of your top two or three or four at most. Um, you know, if you were advising ministers and staff working on their next action plans, what would you like to see in there and what would you pitch and make the case for? Well, um, sticking with my, my theme of political finance transparency, it's, it's really quite simple. It's um, online, real-time, electronic disclosure of the source of all political money, no matter at the, at the, to the point at which it is received. So in the U.S., it's received in lots of points, um, but if it's received by political parties, that at the end of the day, when they tally that information, that that information is filed and tallied online with an immediate you know, access uh, to it by the public. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, it would probably take you know, Sunlight's developers a couple of days to develop that kind of system. So there's no technological challenges, there's just political will. In the US, um, astonishingly, we still, for the, the Senate, um, do not have electronic filing of political information any time. So, you know, while every candidate for office maintains records on um, their, their campaign finance electronically, what they do is they actually print out the pieces of paper and carry it over to the Secretary of the Senate, who then carries it over to the Independent Regulatory Commission, who then key, re keys the information. Um, and that's in you know, the United States. So, so I think it, it's really, it's, it really is just that simple. We should have precisely the same kind of information filed in real time for lobbying activities, which is the first cousin to political finance transparency, is to have real transparency uh, for lobbying activities. Um, and um, all of this should be just as easy as pulling out your phone and punching in a few numbers, and then citizens have access to it on the other side. So I'll just leave yeah, those great. two. This, this is not rocket science in terms of implementation. <laughs> uh, political will is a whole other matter. Frank, what's on your Christmas list? <laughs> yes, a long, a long list, but I'll make, I'll make it short. Two things. Uh, first of all, I fully agree with the, the issue of surveillance or the issues related to national security are certainly not issues. I mean, today we're talking of a scandal that originated in one country, but we should never focus it on one specific or two specific countries. These are global issues for all countries to be concerned. And here, one of the... the, the preoccupations I have is that we're losing, in a way, the debate with public opinion because there's a growing debate around the world where in regards to national security, to strengthen national security, you have to be willing to give away fundamental freedoms. And if you ask anyone around the world, probably public opinion will be in favor of that. Um, I think this is very dangerous. This is when we begin losing the sort of democratic fire in our spirit and the democratic drive. And we have to recuperate this sort of desire and aspiration of defending fundamental freedoms and democratic freedoms, uh, even while we strengthen national security, which both can go hand. There is a, there is a democratic way to do national security. Secondly, I think um, it has to be a, a, an internal struggle, I agree. It has to be a domestic struggle first. It has to come from the people of every nation first. And then you can challenge it on, on international standards. But otherwise, the other way around it, I find it would be very difficult to, to make it work. The, the other issue is that there has to be a transparency in national security to a big extent. 
And here again, the Schwann principles, I think, are important to say, yes, we agree that some elements should not be released because they could jeopardize uh, operations and national security, they could put people in danger. Mm -hmm. But the, the Schwann principles go into very, very strict detail. I think this is the benefit of them. Uh, in, in, in as much as we can get them adopted worldwide in every region and every country accept them, that we will have a common standard uh, in terms of what should be released, including the budget. Let me use my own country. After 36 years of civil war in Guatemala, peace was signed in 96, but even after signing peace, the Ministry of Defense kept on saying that the budget of that ministry was a national secret because it would jeopardize national security. Eventually, we won that battle. And now that budget, as any budget of any ministry, is online and should be known by everyone because it was a source of enormous corruption. The reason why they kept a secret was for corruption, not for, for any, security, any security danger. Mm -hmm. And this is very important. I mean, we should actually disclose economic and financial issues, not only the political side of, of, of how decisions are made and the mechanisms of judiciary and parliamentary control, but also the economic parts of it. Mm -hmm. Two quick recommendations more. On the right to truth, which I said there should be a privilege element of information regarding human rights violations, but this also relates to whistleblowers. I believe that in the case of information related to human rights violations, there's not only a right to disclose, there's a, a moral obligation to disclose. There's no reason why someone should be a witness or fall upon information related to human rights violation and keep a secret. This is something we ought to know and everyone has the right to know. And the only part of that information that should not be released, again, is if it puts anyone in imminent danger, and there's some qualifications like testimonies of witnesses that gave it in confidence or protection of children. But in general, the idea is that all information related to human rights violation should be allowed to be disclosed by public officials or by anyone with no liability. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. a big... A big mouthful, I know, but, but I think this is very important if we're really serious about protecting human rights. And finally, the, the last one, in terms of freedom of expression, um, uh, one of the issues, uh, two issues related, uh, one is on, on, on campaigns. I think one of the most important elements, all the funding of campaigns is important, but especially the part of communication. Who is funding the communications? In some countries, mm -hmm. It is the electoral process itself that funds the campaigns and all that. But in any case, there has to be a full disclosure of how the, the publicity is, is being funded. And for here, I would add, there's another element uh, that goes hand in hand, the, the idea of breaking monopolies and the deconcentration of media is that there should be a commitment, and this is a proposal to the OGP, a commitment by all countries that believe in transparency to establish laws that would disclose the identity of the ownership of media, the full identity. Today, oftentimes, it's difficult to combat monopolies or huge conglomerates of media because you really don't know who the final owners are. You have corporations, you have entities. So there has to be a full disclosure all the way to the names of individuals precisely to avoid that levels of concentration or monopolic, uh, which are all controlled from the FCC in the U.S. to all regulatory bodies around the world. Yeah, yeah. And if you're worried about Alan, you know, Alan's nightmare scenario of drug parents becoming president, um, but the, the trend of organized crime buying up major media, particularly in parts of Eastern Europe, Southeast Europe, the Baltics, look at what's happening in Argentina on these issues. I mean, it, it's equally sort of scary scenario. Um, German, what's on your, your wish well, list? Very, very shortly, because uh, Frank, Frank has um, emphasized uh, transparency, which of course I, I'd be arguing for. So uh, transparency in two respects. Transparency uh, of uh, the kind of uh, government interception requests, um, censorship activities and so on, uh, so that uh, one can actually understand uh, the level of activities uh, developed by intelligence agencies. Um, uh, but also uh, much more openness, uh, because I think that will get much more attention than perhaps those, those just that cold data. Uh, what does it cost? Uh, uh, perhaps uh, issues about, um, you know, I mean, it's when you see the pictures of, of uh, you know, the NSA uh, and this vast um, uh, array of buildings and you understand the, um, uh, you know, giga gigabytes of, of uh, capacity that they have there that you begin to realize, aha, uh -huh, this is something which we should know more about. And I think, so you've got to put it in those terms. And the other thing, because basically we're talking about a really political issue, and I think that's why it belongs in the OGP agenda, mm -hmm. um, 
how do you, in a democratic structure, and what should OGP be therefore bringing in as criteria to watch over, how do you actually ha put your intelligence services under a degree, I say a degree because I don't think you can ever do it 100%, a degree of democratic control? And uh, I think we can improve on where a departed leader of MI6, which is the equivalent of the English CIA, uh, who was being interviewed after he wrote an autobiography, and um, he was asked, you know, do you regret anything in your career? And he said, well, the, the, there is one thing. I mean, uh, our service was totally unaccountable. And, and that's the issue. We've got to try and make it accountable again uh, by Parliament um, and uh, take that much more seriously. Because it's quite clear, if you, if you listen to uh, an, you know, an admirable person like uh, Feinstein in the U.S., uh, basically, she's admitted she didn't really know fully uh, what was going on. We had Kerry saying he didn't fully know what was going on. I'd be very surprised in this country if Foreign Minister Haig knows exactly what's going on, although he's the person who has to approve everything. And so it goes on. Yeah. More. So I think no secret law is a fundamental principle. And that means not only do you have to rely on the law, but you have to explain publicly what you think the law means and what authority uh, it gives you, and you have to make public both internal executive branch and judicial interpretations of, of what the law is. And I think also that anything which involves mass surveillance has to be made public. Uh, it's not okay to say we were picking up every uh, metadata on every phone call in the United States, but not to worry because we had a secret legal opinion saying it was okay. Uh, and we were relying on a law, even though nobody understood that that's uh, what the law meant. Yeah. So as promised, this, uh, this session was certainly not short of controversial and sort of deep and, and worrying issues. Um, I don't want to hold people from lunch. I would, in the spirit of not holding people hostage, I would suggest we give a round of applause close. For those that want to continue the conversation. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Argentina. Thank you to the four up here. Um, but for those that want to continue the chat for a few minutes, feel free to come up. And I'm, I mean, I'll, on their behalf, so we'll, we'll stick around for a bit and keep it going. But thank you all for being here. I unfortunately have a lunch. Yeah, yeah. Argentina is more than the example.